Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Dr. Bruce Lipton, an internationally recognized authority on bridging science and spirit and author of The Biology of Belief, Unleashing the Power of Consciousness, Matter and Miracles, and more recently, co-author of Spontaneous Evolution, Our Positive Future and a Way to Get There from Here. We discuss the amazing new awareness that is currently rewriting the science of biology and medicine. Awareness that the mind's perception of the environment, not genes, controls life at the cellular level. And also how our changing understanding of biology will help us navigate this turbulent period in our planet's history and how each of us can participate in this global shift. Hello and welcome Bruce Lipton and thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Well, Greg, I am so excited to be here, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak to the public with some very important uh, timely messages about the events in our uh, upside-down world here. Yeah, well, today, Bruce, we're going to be talking about a lot of the ideas um, and new information that's coming out of your work and specifically documented in two books, uh, Your Biology of Belief, which came out back in 2006, though that has since been updated uh, to reflect new research, and also uh, last year, uh, 2011, a book called Spontaneous Evolution, Our Positive Future, uh, which was uh, co-authored with Steve, is it Behrman? We pronounce Behrman, it? yes, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's Steve Behrman. And perhaps we should set the scene uh, for folks here, and the fundamental uh, concept that underlies your work um, is to do with our genes, which um, a lot of people have the basic perception that genes control what we, not only what we look like, but quite often how our lives play out and uh, what people expect to happen and what they believe is dictated uh, by forces outside of their control. But so perhaps you could give us the big picture that underlies all of this, because uh, your take on this is really quite different. Yeah, well, uh, if I could very quickly just uh, relay a very simple experiment that occurred about 45 years ago. I was working on stem cells, and about 45 years ago, there was only a handful of us in the entire world that even knew what a stem cell was. So I was in a small but uh, very interesting group of researchers. Uh, a stem cell, just very simply, is this. It's the equivalent of an embryonic cell. It, has, uh, it could form uh, any uh, cell type or tissue type in your entire body. Uh, stem cells are very important for a simple reason is that every day, uh, just through uh, age and trauma and, and uh, falling apart, we lose hundreds of billions of our cells through uh, attrition. They just get lost. Well, the idea that's really important is you cannot do this without replacing the cells. Otherwise, we die out. So how do we replace all the cells that are damaged and lost in our body, like our skin cells or something like this? It's like the digestive tract, the lining of this very long digestive tract. The cells are replaced every three days. That's like a trillion cells. You know, it's like, okay, where are you getting the cells from? The answer is stem cells. Uh, uh, and they're like leftover embryonic cells. They were, they were called embryonic cells the moment before you were born. And after you're born, I look at the same cell and say, now it's a stem cell because you're not an embryo anymore. So I just want people to understand a stem cell and embryonic cell are functionally the same. So uh, what was the point? I put one stem cell in a Petri dish all by itself, and it would divide every 10 or 12 hours. Uh, The net result is in one week, I have about 50,000 cells in the Petri dish. But the most important point is all the cells are genetically identical because they came from the same source. But here's the experiment. I I take these 50,000 genetically identical cells, split them up into three different Petri dishes, and change the environment ever so slightly and the environment for a cell just think of a cell like a fish it needs to live in fluid and that's why when you cut yourself open fluids run out because it's like an aquarium inside and the culture medium in a culture dish is to replicate that internal condition as best we can so the cells growing in the plastic dish are uh, more like they're at home uh, as i can make them so here's the point 50,000 genetically identical cells split into three petri dishes change the culture medium the environment slightly in each dish and one dish the cells form muscle a second dish the cells form bone and a third dish the cells form fat cells the most important and profound understanding in this is that we've been saying genes control uh, our biology our fate and our lives and here i have uh, genetically identical cells in three different environments and they form three different fates the point is very profound and that is The genes didn't control the biology. It was the cells interaction with the environment that controlled the genes. 
And you and you say, well, that's real interesting. I go, well, it's a revolution in thinking because as you introduced, we've been programmed with the belief that genes control us. That uh, and as far as we know, you know, we didn't pick the gene that came in. If we don't like the genes we have, uh, we can't go out and just change genes. So all of a sudden, you realize your life is controlled by these factors, these genes, and you have no control over them. That belief is a belief in victimization. I'm a victim of my heredity. There's cancer in my family or Alzheimer's or cardiovascular disease. And uh, our belief, oh, these are controlled by genes, and I'm going to be a recipient of those genes. And as a consequence, my fate is determined, victim, poor me. And I say, well, what's different? The new biology says, no, the genes are controlled by the organism's response to the environment. And why is that important? Because since we can change our environment, then we can control the activity of our genes. And it turns out it's not just the environment, but it's our perception of the environment. Uh, all of a sudden I say, wait, old belief, control life, I'm a victim. New belief, it's called epi. Genetics, epi means above. So when I say genetic control, I'm saying control by genes. When I say epigenetic control, I'm saying control above the genes, above is our mind. And all of a sudden it says, oh my God, I'm free to change my environment, change my mind. And all of a sudden it says, well, then I'm not a victim of my genes, I'm a master of genes. My beliefs control my genetics. And that's when we have to start to then review. What are our beliefs? <laughs> and especially even just in the nature of genes, I'm a victim and my beliefs become my biology. So I create victim. And yet we change our beliefs and we become masters. Wow, that was a long discourse, uh, Greg. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> what's the idea about all this is that we live in a world where we believe we are frail, vulnerable people, victims of things around us viruses, bacteria, parasites, and all of that, and that uh, we're just helpless creatures when it turns out we are so powerful <laughs> that we don't, we underestimate who we really are. I mean, take an example, uh, people can walk across hot coals. Of course, that's based on their belief issues. Those that uh, waver in that belief as they're walking across the coals immediately get burned. So it's, a, it's really a belief issue. Uh, um, another thing, I, I show pictures in my lecture of these uh, uh, weightlifters, these muscle-bound guys, and there's a guy lifting up a, the tail end of a car, perspiration, muscles bulging, and we go, wow, yeah, you got to be really strong. And then I show a bunch of articles about everyday average women who lift up a car if their child's caught underneath the car. And I've got articles from all over the world about that. And basically says, oh, my God, an unathletic, untrained woman uh, can lift up the car uh, with the same ability as this muscle-bound guy. But it's based on belief because when, when her child's under the car, there's no uh, doubt in her mind that she's going to lift that car. And she does. Uh, and, and one last one, just to show the power of our minds. Uh, down here in the U.S. and the South, we got people that work, the uh, fundamentalists, that work themselves up into a religious ecstasy. And they do what is called testify. They, they do things to show that God protects them no matter how stupid the thing is that they do, such as playing with very poisonous snakes, rattlesnakes, copperheads, cottonmouth snakes. These are very poisonous. And with the belief that God protects them, these serpent handlers play with these snakes. And even if they get bitten, they don't have really any negative consequences. But those are the lightweights, because the one I really want to talk about are the guys and women who drink strychnine poison in toxic doses with the firm belief that God will protect them uh, and so guess what? They drink absolute poison and they have no harmful consequences. W what allows that to happen? The answer is their belief. So all of a sudden it says, we believe we're frail. Then I can say, oh, yeah, but you can walk across fire. You can lift up a car. You can drink poison. And all of a sudden, maybe not as frail as we think we are. Now, there'll be some people who will <clears throat> perhaps be listening to this and think in terms of applying this to your day to day life and making positive changes, that what you're describing is a form of quote unquote positive thinking. You do address this in spontaneous evolution to say there's a little bit more to this than just, you know, reading Think and Grow Rich and writing a wish list and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the uh, that's like this. Uh, the lazy way of thinking, oh, all I have to do is just sit here and my thoughts will manifest everything in front of me. Uh, not in today's world. <laughs> and there's a reason for this. And, and there, here are the two influences on why positive thinking doesn't work as well as we would like it to work in most cases. Number one, 
Yes, indeed, the mind controls our biology and our behavior, but then we have to recognize there are two minds. And this is very critical to whatever discussion we have, uh, Greg, so I'll just go into it a little bit. There's the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. The conscious mind, the latest edition of evolution, is uh, a lobe of your brain right behind your forehead called the prefrontal cortex. Cortex. The previous to that development of that lobe, the rest of the brain, by definition, is today what we call the subconscious mind. And then we add that lobe and we add the conscious mind. And I say, well, what's the nature of this new prefrontal cortex? Well, it's a seat of our personal identity. It's uh, our source. It's uh, our connection with spirit. This is where we as individuals stand out in the conscious mind. The uh, subconscious mind is a little different. The subconscious mind is the equivalent of a of a recording and playback device. It records experiences, push the button, plays the experiences back. It's where habits come from, for example. And here's the big difference. The conscious mind is you. That mind <clears throat> is creative. So if I say, hey, Greg, what are you doing next week? Uh, I think you could think into the future and give me an idea what you're going to do. Or, uh, and, and right away, by definition, that's creativity for a simple reason. Next week's not here, and yet you already have a vision. So uh, that's an example of creativity. But the other factor of the conscious mind is this. It, it can go in time. It could go forwards the next week. It can review last week. Uh, the conscious mind, uh, you can have a daydream so that you're up in your head someplace uh, while you're awake but not paying attention. Uh, here's the point. The conscious mind, creative, listen to this, this is critical, the conscious creative mind has your wishes, desires, and what you want from life. It also is the source of positive thinking, which by nature is creative thinking. So I say, okay, all of this comes from this conscious mind. And then I also, then I throw in the monkey wrench to the conscious mind, that is this, when you're thinking or uh, looking into the future, reviewing life, looking into the past, uh, making plans. When you're thinking, the conscious mind, by definition, is not paying attention. And so when you're thinking, the brain defaults into the programs of the subconscious mind. So, that, so for example, you give a simple example. Uh, when you first tried to learn how to drive a car, you had to practice, and you practice. Well, practicing makes a habit, and so you learn how to drive a car by creating a habit in your subconscious mind. When you've been driving a car for years, guess what? You, you don't think about the details of driving. Let's say you and I get in the car, Greg, and you're driving. You, we're going to go to some place. You put the key in. We start driving. We get into this great conversation. And, uh, and at some point, and I'm sure you've experienced this, as most all of us have, is you look out the window and you realize you haven't paid attention to the road for the last 10 minutes. You were so involved in the discussion. And I go, well, very important fact about that. Number one, uh, your conscious mind was focused on the discussion. So by default, the operations of the rest of your life, including the driving, the driving the car, are run by the subconscious mind, the habit mind. You learned how to drive a car, so knowing how to drive a car is already built into the mind and uh, the subconscious mind. And, and, and more important, just to add this little note to say the subconscious mind is not a bad thing, but it's very powerful. It's a million times more powerful a computer than the conscious mind. So uh, here's the point. We're back in the car We've just driven uh, 10 minutes while we're in this great conversation. You look up the window and you say, oh, my goodness, I really haven't paid attention to the road while we're having a conversation. I go, yeah, right. But then I say this, uh, Greg, can you tell me what we talked about in our conversation? You go, yeah, Bruce, we talked about this and this and this. I go, great. Then I say, Greg, tell me what happened on the road while we were driving for 10 minutes. And then you go, well, I, I don't really know. I wasn't paying attention. And I go, Okay, that's the story, and that's the major point. It goes like this. When our conscious minds are focused on things, whether in the future or the past or conversation or just daydreaming, our default runs to the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind has programs in it that allow us from habit to carry out whether it's our job, driving a car, walking. You don't have to pay attention to the, the programs because they're automatic. They're habits. Now, here... The big monkey wrench, and if people get this, this is why their lives don't work the way they think they want them to work, and it works like it's because of this.